30s and 40s oh at night. Oh, my so, gosh. Yeah. In your house? It's supposed to be fixed tomorrow. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, in my house is, is in uh, just gets down to the high 40s right now. Wow. So it's cold, but I'm firing up the, the kitchen stove and the uh, fireplaces tonight. Yeah. Keep warm. Wow. By tomorrow. Yeah. Eek. Hopefully that gets uh, taken care of pretty soon. Yeah, tomorrow, they said. Yeah. So my guest is Lee Spiegel uh, of the Huffington Post. And what's really exciting about that, I don't know if you've noticed this, he's written a couple stories on the Podesta WikiLeaks, uh, and of course, on the UFO side of things, so the UFO WikiLeaks. What's exciting about this is that these stories, typically his stories get in weird news, his UFO stories, and a lot of people mm-hmm. complain, why are they in weird news? Why does this have to be in weird news? Why can't it be in regular news or science or something like that? And of course, he would love for that, and he always tries for that to happen. Uh, so it's not his fault. That's just where he works, and that's where they like to put the UFO stuff. But these two WikiLeaks stories he's written so far have been put in the pol- politics section, and mm. they've both made it to the front page. Wow. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Great. Yeah. And people may not realize that uh, um, Huffington Post is actually a top 10 when it comes to... Uh, the how busy news it is source. yeah as oh, far as oh, an yeah. online news source so uh, a lot of people looking at that stuff so that's fun so we'll talk about these stories we'll talk about the ufo wiki leaks and it will be a lot of fun can't wait yay these were my favorites yeah and you know what's going to come up we'll have to plug this is we've got to do like we did last year you know our our end of year ufo thing yeah, I can't wait for that. Or maybe we'll do it in early January, where, but we'll do our, our year in review at some point with uh, you and I and Lee, and that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, this will be your second to... one. You were a mm-hmm. rookie last year. That's right. Yeah. I didn't get picked on too bad. No, no. no. Yeah. We pick on, well, I pick on Lee, and, and he picks on me, and we all kind of get, e- get at each other, because we, yeah. you know, what's uh, the best stories. So, yeah, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, But before that, of course, we talk about UFOs in the news. Um, What you got there, buddy? Well, kind of local to me, this happened in Nashua, New Hampshire. And uh, a military uh, military helicopter reported chasing a UFO. Um, So in New Hampshire, there's a a kind of one of the bigger cities in New Hampshire is called Nashua, South South, uh, New Hampshire. And uh, this is a report from uh, MUFON uh, written by Roger Marsh. This happened on October 15th of this year. And uh, here's a quote. Uh, I heard an extremely loud, very low flying helicopter somewhere over the woods behind my apartment in southern air in the southern area of Nashua, which is not all at all normal occurrence here. The witness stated my wife and two sons were present. We were getting ready for dinner. We grew increasingly alarmed as the helicopter sound grew louder and louder until we could feel it vibrating. So they, him and his son go out um, to the deck and they're looking over. They can't see this helicopter. And all of a sudden uh, they see this uh, orb come up. It was a reddish orange uh, like light and it breaks over the tree line and it heads south and it goes in a straight line perpendicular across their view over the the uh, the uh, house line the house tops and uh, it's and so it didn't change course it didn't wobble and then it the military looking helicopter came up out of the woods and started chasing or it appeared that it was chasing it and uh, they couldn't see any visible markings on the helicopter to be sure but a couple of things this uh, is very similar to an incident that happened in Nashua, the same town, in 2014, except that uh, that craft that was being chased was more like a triangular. And if you Google that, you can see that uh, that happened, like I said, back in 2014. And so uh, that, to me, is very interesting. Anytime a helicopter is chasing something like that, particularly because 
you don't really hear anyone ever talk about it. You know, and if it is military and uh, they're ordered not to speak about it, I can understand. But you think eventually more people will come out with that. And you, know, you do hear a lot of talk about either jets or um, or helicopters chasing these whatever they are. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And um, there is actually, I haven't written about this or anything, but there is a WikiLeaks that just came out, I think today even, I I was reading earlier, uh, where an author who wrote a book about uh, some military thing, but uh, he had written John Podesta and Leslie Kane, or at least in regard to her book, uh, because John Podesta does a foreword, and he was a military guy, and he was saying, you know, he was hanging around with these military guys when he wrote his book and uh, that they had some UFO stories. So it seemed like, you know, they were having these occurrences. Uh, but he, he sounded like they're they're just as um, baffled as anyone else. They catch him on mm-hmm. radar and stuff and they're like, yeah, I don't know what the hell that was. And they just call him a fast walker or a, a UFO and that's it. They just tell stories like the rest of us. So... Um, that was kind of cool. Yeah. In fact, the story I was going to talk about is an, is a military case. Ah, um, before you do that, um, just, just one of the things, you know, I'm thinking of. So when they see them on radar and they're chasing them, what would happen if they caught them? (laughs) I know they do. That's a great question. I mean, we have a lot of stories about the jets chasing and not catching them so for instance yeah. in blue book there's there's many of these cases of course the 1952 washington dc incident uh may be the most famous where the pilots even said we tried to vector in on them but they disappeared every time we got close so you never hear about uh them catching up um there is a case a real famous one in um I think it was Chile, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's Chile or Argentina. It's a South American country, and I can't remember. Right now, I'm blanking on exactly where. It's actually it was in my talk at MUFON Symposium, but because uh, it influenced them starting up. a. Uh, but this jet chased one of the objects, and he was like, I was hitting that thing. That thing, my bullets were going into the object that would have shredded a truck, but it seemed to have no effect on this object. Uh, Mm. Like they were bouncing off or they were going through, but that's the closest I've, I've, I can recall or have heard. So maybe when, or if they've ever caught up with them, maybe they never have, but if they have, maybe those uh, cases are just uh, a little more um, sensitive. And so we don't hear about them. I wonder if when they're sent out to, if they're just sent out for observation only, you know, initially. Who knows? I mean, you know, people make an argument that the first thing that we would, will probably do is send out probes, just like we're doing to Mars. We've got all kinds of probes mm-hmm. and robots on Mars that that's what we would do. Even if we had a technology to send something really far, uh, it would most likely be a probe. Uh, a satellite right. to check something out. Um, so that's a that's a possibility. It would make sense. Uh, actually, what I meant by that was I'm wondering if the military sends these oh. jets out, you know, for observation. But yeah. no, I I understand what you're saying too, and I I do agree with that. Yeah. Um, you know, if we are being visited, you know, most likely, uh, we would be first visited by some type of probe or um, drone or of something. Yeah. You know, not necessarily occupied. Yep. So I know we got way off topic on that one, didn't we? No, not really. It's UFOs. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) So uh, the one I wanted to talk about is uh, in Georgia. And if you saw this story, maybe you got uh, fooled by the picture. Because I did this great Photoshop job of what this person said he saw. Uh, which was this orb kind of watching him and his buddies. And um, actually, I'm just kidding. It was just kind of a very novice photoshopping job I did. But uh, it at least, you know, is trying to depict what happened. Um, in fact, it looks kind of silly now that I look at my picture here. But uh, 
It's cute, maybe. But anyways, <laughs> this is a Georgia military guy. He's at Fort Benning, um, Georgia. This is actually where they train snipers and stuff like this. But uh, it was July 10th, 2005. And their platoon uh, was doing some training. And the first half of the day, half of the pl platoon went out. And then the second half of the day, the rest of the pl platoon went out. He was in the second part. However, when some of the guys came back from the first half of the day, they said there was a UFO out there. They're like, there's this orb flying around out there. And he thought, what? You guys are crazy. They're, they're making stuff up. Uh, but they went out there. In the second half of the day, and he's like, sure enough, there was this, this orb flying around. It was, uh, it was an orb, and it was loud. It was making a loud buzzing noise. And he thought, you know, wow, this must be ours. Maybe they're testing it on us to observe us. Um, he's like, I don't know what the heck this was. So he, he thinks it could be one of ours, but it was this silver round object he said there were no openings or anything it was just a solid silver round object it was fairly loud making this loud buzzing noise and observing them just over the treetops so how hmm. weird is that this was 2005 talk about probe that sounds like one yeah there you go i yeah. mean but it, if if it is it must be using some sort of odd propulsion um, it was buzzing loud, so maybe some electrical mm. type of propulsion, or, or of course, assuming this this is a true story, but uh, that's pretty damn weird, isn't it? And I mean, if there is, a, it is a round probe, uh, and and if it is ours, you know, um, this could explain maybe the Homeland Security video over Puerto Rico, mm. or even the more recent one, the uh, police in, in, in the UK, who also captured something similar on their FLIR, uh, something that is difficult, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. if not impossible to see by the eye, but they could see it on the, the FLIR. Um, pretty weird one. It's a pretty interesting yeah, read. Another thing that comes to question on a sighting like this is, and it's a, another big question mark is, you know, it's like Rendlesham Force. It happens, you know, three days in a row or five days in a row or something like that. That That's just bizarre in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, wh why whatever it is would stay in one area. I mean, if it can travel from wherever it is to get here, why does it stick in one little area? You know, I yeah. mean, that's that is a, is another uh, another question. Yep. What the hell's going on, man? Right. Weird mm. stuff weird stuff the last thing i wanted to mention i don't know if i mentioned this the last week or 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 on your show but uh did i talk about denver international airport probably not no this is just kind of cool and i wrote a story on it but um the denver international airport uh, of course there's a lot of conspiracy theories around it I used to live in Denver, especially during the time of all these conspiracy pictures. I've got pictures of all the things that people say are strange and blah, blah, blah. But, um, uh, you know, having been in the area and watched it, they've all pretty much been debunked. So, But hmm. what's interesting about this is that uh, the, the airport itself has adopted these conspiracy theories and they've kind of embraced them and have used them for marketing, so which is kind of funny. So a few years ago, they were, uh, in 2013, they were opening or they're building this huge new area. It's kind of a, a travel uh, center where the train is going to come up, the, uh, the light rail train uh, from downtown to the airport. And uh, it's this cool train station and everything. And at the midway point of having this done in October of 2013, just a couple of years ago, they, they had a big party there to celebrate this midway point. And the party was conspiracy and alien themed. <laughs> so they had all these alien things and stuff like this. And, and they had former mayors uh, enact a phone call where they were pretending to, um, you know, be talking about aliens and stuff like this. So, in fact, Five Symington. No. 
No, this is in Denver. So I know. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I wrote about it, and then the PR people from the DIA sent me a video on it, too, that said, hey, you put this in your story. So I did. Well, just this, I don't know when, but my cousin Jason actually sent this to me. That's how I found out. They put up an exhibit recently in the airport, a conspiracy exhibit. It's just a small little exhibit uh, in this art area where they've got other art and everything. And they have a plaque there, or at least a stand there, with some of the stories about the conspiracies. And they have open minds, like, prominent on this thing. In fact, it's pretty much about our story. Um, wow, that's great. Yeah, pretty cool. And then they also included the UFO Chronicles. Uh, they wrote about it, too. They probably just reposted our story, uh, which, you know, is great. They've linked back to us, and we love UFO Chronicles. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so that's pretty funny. So you can see it there, and it's kind of fun because they also have this alien skull because they, back during when they did this, they pretended to, like, uncover this alien skull and stuff like that as part of their marketing. So it's uh, it's pretty fun. Awesome. Yeah. Well, extra publicity there. Yeah, pretty cool of them. They know you're a you're a, a local. Yep, I I am a Denver native. In fact, I've got my Denver Broncos T-shirt on right now. <laughs> orange, I'm sure. It blue and orange. It's old school. It's uh, pretty cool. All right. Well, is there anything else you wanted to mention, my friend? No, I'm about done. I got to get back to my freezing cold uh, living room. Yeah, I hope, so, I hope you keep warm. Hopefully you don't have to, like, uh, start a fire with your furniture or something like that. Yeah, it may come to that. I don't know. Yeah. But eek, anyway. Uh-oh. Well, looking forward to hearing Lee on your show. Yeah, thanks. Let's go ahead and hear what he's got to say. I am super happy, as I always am, to be here with my good buddy, Lee Spiegel. How you doing, buddy? I'm feeling great, and and right back at you, you are my good buddy, <laughs> Alejandro Rojas. So, you have had a couple stories, both on the WikiLeaks UFO situation, and <laughs> both of them have made the front page of Huffington Post. Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's always a crapshoot with that kind of stuff, because all of us who write for HuffPost... We, we all want the front page editors to find our stories and put them on the front page uh, for the world to see. Um, we never ask, we never requested, please take my story and put it on the front page. That would, that would not seem right. Um, about a lot of my stories lately have hit the front page, even stories that haven't been involved with UFOs or weird news. I've had a, a lot of science stories lately that I've written that, that have done that. Um, and I'm very grateful for that really and the, the the two wikileaks related stories um involve some of these hacked emails um the first one was um a series of emails in which uh it seems like the late edgar mitchell uh, apollo moonwalker the sixth man to walk on the moon was trying to get a, a meeting set up with john podesta as another man whose name has been in the news a lot mm. lately, uh, Podesta being the uh, Hillary Clinton uh, chairman of her campaign and who has his own UFO background of trying to get the government to unlock UFO files that have been locked for, for decades. Uh, and, and so a couple of those emails involves um, Edgar Mitchell trying to get a meeting with Podesta to discuss uh, what the government knows and what he might be able to do to help further the idea of disclosure, uh, not just UFO disclosure, but extraterrestrial presence on Earth yeah. disclosure. Well, and before we get into more detail, because we will, uh, we'll unpack all of this story. Uh, in fact, that's what we'll do in this interview, because there's a lot to it. In fact, there's three stories because there's also your other story, which is a great one. I don't think people know as well that you picked up on, which was her comment about Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah. Which is you know, er er earlier this year in March, um, I and many other people, I, I think you also did a story about this, too, um, 
Hillary Clinton was on the Jimmy yeah. Kimmel show in March, and and at one point in their conversation, Kimmel started asking her about UFOs. He, he did it with something like, you know, we've had your husband, Bill Clinton, here before. We've talked about UFOs, and I, I asked him if he bothered to look into UFOs, and he said that he did, and he found nothing. Is that true? Did he find nothing? And, and Hillary came right back and said, well, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's but, leave but it at that for now. Yeah. Because we'll and, get and more into this one. Yeah. And, and so, and no, no, so, no. Yeah. So, wait, wait, wait. Then the third uh, okay. story, we'll get into this. We'll get into oh, all okay. of these in detail okay. because right. uh, we, we don't want the thumbnail on this one. We want the full, <laughs> the full Monty. <laughs> and uh, so, the third, right. of course, being the Tom DeLong story. Uh, yeah. So, which is really uh, interesting as well. But before we get into the details of each of these stories, I wanted to mention one other thing. Not only, which is, this is really significant, I think. Not only have these stories gotten on the front page of Huffington Post, they also are not in weird news. They're in the politics section. Yeah. Um, which is cool. You know, I mean, UFOs are breaching, at least at the Huffington Post. I know you get a lot of feedback. Why are your stories in weird? They should be elsewhere. For the, for the longest time, um, people had had complained to me, why 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 is your why are your UFO stories um, in weird? Don't you have a a UFO section? And no, we didn't really have a, a UFO section, um, but. And I always had to kind of express why I thought that it, was, it belonged in weird, because if I, if I didn't have any UFO stories in weird, I'd have them nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I've, I've been lucky to try to find some kind of angles and spins on some of these stories so that so that they might be welcomed into the politics section and into the science section. Uh, and and I've, I've done stories where I focused on the Vatican interest in extraterrestrial life so that I could get it into the religion section. You know, I mean, I don't, it's okay for my stories to be in weird, but, but I, my, my attitude is enough is enough. It's not just weird. These stories belong in other places that gives the stories a little bit more credibility with the readers. Is this the first time though your UFO stories have breached weird? Um, these got in politics, but have you got a UFO? I don't think, cause I know how science is at Huffington Post. Yeah. Uh, have they done a UFO? I know they do ET stuff with like Shawstack and you've written on, uh, astrobiology, but, uh, yeah. has UFOs, uh, you have you been able to get them in science or elsewhere? Is yes. That? Uh, I mean, what, what, one of the things about, um, about being on staff uh, as as a writer with HuffPost is that when I know that I'm going to be writing a story about something, uh, and if it's if it has anything to do with UFOs or or the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know, the, like the SETI Institute, um, what I will do ahead of time is I'll go to I'll go to my friends in the science section and say I'm I'm working on this story. Uh, would you like me to cross it over to your section as well? Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll and I'll explain to them why I think it would work well for them, and they'll generally say yes. Which means that what they're saying to me is, when your story is published, we'll put it up on our page. Cool. Uh, you know, and and so I've I've tried to stay on top of that. I've I've tried to to be aware that my stories can find a home on places other than weird because. You know, if if I if I have a story, lots of my stories lately have been on weird and science and politics. Well, if I want to send that story to someone out there in in the world and say, look at look at my recent story about so and so um, in the politics section, I I won't even tell them that it was in the weird section. And it's not like I'm embarrassed that it's in weird, but I want people to know that this whole thing that that you and I write about and we research all the time. It's not just weird. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of serious stuff about what we write about. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we need to let people know that. And this is, this is my way of saying to the people at HuffPost, listen, I think my story would work well in your section and in your section. Uh, let me just give it to your section and hope that you'll put it up 
And and I'll tell you, what I do with every single story that I write, uh, if I think that it might be on one of three sections, as soon as my stories are published and it's up there on at least on the weird news page, I will go to the other sections just to see if they grabbed it because mm-hmm. I want to know if, yeah. it's, if it's somewhere yeah. else. Mm-hmm. So let's get into these particular stories now. Okay. And let's tackle the smallest one first because it just has to do with one email. But it, it, I think this story is great. I think all of these are great. But this being the Jimmy Kimmel one. So you were explaining yeah. how uh, Hillary it was on Jimmy Kimmel in March. and in March. Um, But that this email actually had to do with an appearance she had last year. Um, but Which it, I didn't know about. Yeah. which But it gave us insight into that appearance yes. last time. Very interesting insight. So go ahead. Go ahead and explain this. Sorry. The, the it's a, it helps to to talk for us about the march of, okay she was very anxious to answer any of jimmy kimmel's questions about ufos she mm-hmm. was almost too anxious to talk about yeah unidentified surprisingly objects. yeah and she said that you know my husband couldn't come up with the information but i will when i'm elected president uh i'm going to do whatever i can to to, to make sure that that the classified files on ufos will be will be released to the public unless of course here's that caveat unless they have something to do with national security well you, you know I'm, I'm sitting there watching the show and i'm thinking i'm yelling at the tv screen hillary every credible ufo story has something to do with national security yeah <laughs> you know right. no matter how you spin it um <clears throat> but in this exchange with kimmel she said you know jimmy um, there's a new name, and it's called, uh, the way she said it was, Unexplained Aerial Phenomenon. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, no, that's that's not right, Hillary. And then she said, and it's it's UAP. And that's, she says, that's the new nomenclature. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy said, well, I'm not sure I like that. I, I'd rather just keep calling them UFOs. And Hillary said, well, we can, we can inter- interchange them, you know, back and forth. And 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 at that point, I I said, is Jimmy going to ask her a, a question like, how do you know about this thing called UAP, mm-hmm. you know, Madam mm-hmm. Madam Secretary? And he didn't. He didn't follow up at all. I was sitting in my living room. I'm asking her the questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Hillary, tell us how you know this. How do you know this? Why why did you mangle what UAP stands for? And 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 they. They didn't go much further than that. So, okay, fine. So she tried to get the concept of UAPs out. And the public didn't know where she came up with that that that, that term. She didn't say that many scientists have been using that term since, since uh, the late 1990s, um, s- since Dr. Richard Haynes, former NASA research scientist, came up with this phrase, um, and and the actual phrase was unidentified aerial phenomena. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the actual phrase that talks about or describes uh, in the aviation world what airline pilots come up against. Mm-hmm. And, and you started- mentioned Richard Haynes, who works with, who is a founder and works with NARCAP. Um, yeah. And uh, we're going to have Ted Rowe at the UFO Congress this year. Who oh, also good. works with NARCAP, and uh, you know we know that Ted Rowe and Richard Haynes met with John Podesta and told him this, and that's how John Podesta knows about UAPs, and thus it got to Hillary. But we know more now. On well, top yeah, of that. yeah, because obviously throughout this year, both Hillary and John Podesta have told reporters that they've been talking about UFOs and that Podesta has urged her and convinced her that she needs to make this information available. So obviously all this information that she thinks she's in, you know, putting out there to the public to, to sound like she knows what she's talking about came mostly from John Podesta. Mm-hmm. So, so, but I was curious about how she found out about, you know, the whole UAP thing. And I didn't think anything more of it until last week when this, other little little teeny weeny WikiLeak email comes up, and the 
the the the subject line, even a subject line was was mangled. I don't know if it was mangled by Podesta or someone else, but but it it basically it said um, how as Jimmy Kimmel. I, thought, well, <laughs> I didn't notice what? that. <laughs> yeah, how no was w, I think? Yeah, should have been how was. And I thought, well, what does that mean? And and you go to to read just in the first paragraph, you realize that last November, 2015, Hillary Clinton was on the Jimmy Kimmel show. And and she was talking about a variety of things that, that, that deal with issues that the country is really involved with and climate change and things that are important. And and the interview lasted just a couple of minutes. And and, and apparently that that was it. I mean, that was I actually went back into uh, YouTube and I watched the interview uh, from last November and there was nothing mentioned about UFOs and the the WikiLeak memo that we're talking about the email was apparently instigated by Podesta to uh, Christina Shackey I believe is her name Christina is the the deputy communications director for Hillary Clinton and Podesta was writing to her saying how was Jimmy Kimmel he's basically saying how did she do on Jimmy Kimmel show last night um because apparently he must have had some discussion either with 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 the Kimmel people or with Hillary that they were going to talk UFOs and the response maybe although we don't know for sure no we don't know for sure but but the, but the thing is um something had to have gone down because <clears throat> In that first paragraph of this little WikiLeak email, um, the deputy communications director, Christina, responded to Podesta saying uh, she was great. She's a really good interviewee. She's going to look good on television. But um, he, he didn't ask her anything about UFOs. And she was very disappointed because she spent five minutes ahead of time practicing UAPs. And I went, whoa, this is cool. <laughs> this is good stuff. Yeah. I'm writing about this. I, I mean, that was great. In, in just two or three sentences, it was like, it was so much information right there, mm -hmm. which said to me, if she was practicing what UAPs are and what, and what it stands for, that means she was prompted to do that and probably from Podesta uh -huh. and, and she was ready to go on Jimmy Kimmel that night and talk UFOs and it never happened. Yeah. Now that I don't happened. know that it was scheduled to happen. Some people have assumed that and you know, um, because, uh, sh they may have anticipated it for the same reason we have been excited. We were excited for him to interview Hillary uh, because we anticipated him to ask about UFOs, because he had asked Bill about UFOs, and he had asked um, Obama, Obama about UFOs. So it only so we were all hoping he would ask her about UFOs, uh, which luckily eventually he did. And I would imagine that it did get back to him that you know Hillary was all prepared to talk about UAPs. Uh, he might have gone, <laughs> "What the hell is that?" Uh, so maybe you should ask her next time, which, yeah. And, 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 you know, and the other thing is I've noticed, and maybe you have too, because both you and I have been kind of following this whole Hillary Clinton, John Podesta, let's talk about UFOs. Podesta has, has actually tweeted and has encouraged mm -hmm. members of the media that when you're interviewing Hillary Clinton, ask her about UFOs. He, he has wanted her to, to talk about it, but he's wanted her to be doing it as as a response to being asked about UFOs. As far as I know, since she started talking about UFOs, I don't think she's done any interviews in which she initiated the topic. It always came from someone else, mm -hmm. but then she was happy to talk about it. But right. it never came from her, you know. Yeah. And that and, and that's why when I wrote my story the other day uh, about this this whole Jimmy Kimmel thing. I included in my story that I think that someone from the uh, the Clinton camp should put a bug in her ear before the final debate with Trump, mm -hmm. and and that, that if Chris Wallace, the moderator, doesn't ask a question about UFOs because that's how it always comes up, that they should 
they should kind of suggest to Hillary ahead of time, if he doesn't ask about UFOs, no matter how the debate is going, no matter how crazy it is between you and Trump, somehow if you can get the word UFO in there so that you initiate it, why now, that would go viral. <laughs> I was hoping that viral. would happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, Steve Bassett and others, uh, but I know Steve Bassett wrote some kind of email to Chris Wallace, and, and I think he was tweeting him or, or had some sort of campaign where he was yeah. hoping that that would happen. Uh, who, he runs a paradigm research, a lobbyist guy, and he even had a story. I, th I don't know if it's Washington Post. Somebody wrote a story that, you know, about Steve Bassett and, and how they're hoping that uh, Hillary is going to talk about UFOs uh, at the uh, during the debate or something like that. But Wallace didn't bring it up, and those debates uh, go by so quickly, they didn't get to many things people complain oh. about. They didn't get to no. more minority issues, climate change, blah, blah, this and that, the pipeline or whatever, all issues which the public and uh, maybe you – uh, maybe I feel are a little more pressing than the yeah. UFOs right now, and and that and that that's okay, but but I I I, I tried to impress uh, on people that so far in these debates, every time the moderators, whoever they happen to be, would ask a, an important question of Donald Trump, he would always go off topic, so it didn't matter, you know. He, yeah, true. He, was, he, was, he wasn't sticking to the questions that were mm -hmm. being asked. And so I was trying to get people into the head of, if you can just get Hillary to say something about UFOs, and then the moderator would feel compelled to turn to Donald Trump and say, Mr. Trump, you have two minutes to respond. <laughs> well, you know, and this is funny, because you and I, I think, talked about this months ago. Uh, and uh, I know I've talked with others about it, but um, I'm sure we talked about it. Now that it's all almost over, I'm a bit surprised. I thought since Hillary started talking about UFOs, at some point, Trump would kind of throw that in her face and try to make fun of her over this yep. topic. Uh, but he hasn't. I know. I know. And, and you know, the, the, the precedent for that was, uh, I guess it was in the 2007 uh, debates, mm -hmm. um, and it was Tim Russert, mm -hmm. uh, the late Tim Russert from NBC's Meet the Press, uh, who asked um, Representative Dennis Kucinich, of, of, was he from Ohio, I believe. And, and the question came up during one of the debates of, um, of we understand that you uh, have, have claimed to have seen a UFO at some point in your life. Would you care to explain that? And Kucinich did explain it, but he never once said that it was spaceships, never once said it was like little green men. He said, I once saw something that I couldn't explain. I thought it was pretty amazing. It hasn't been explained to me, and that was that. Mm -hmm. But everybody else blew it up, and, well, he's, he, he, he didn't become president. Partially right. because, <laughs> you know, he quit because, soon after. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it goes back to that. It speaks to that ridicule factor mm -hmm. that still is... is exists in our culture mm -hmm. uh that anybody in any kind of a prominent position that might you know feel uh that it's okay for them to talk about any ufo encounter that they might have had or any kind of paranormal experience um if if they decide to do it they, they run the risk of of ridicule from everybody all over the place mm -hmm. now so, so but but hillary didn't seem to have that that feeling she was ready and willing to talk about it yeah and podesta is always ready and willing to talk about it he does bring yeah. it up himself and that brings yeah. us to the second story the other story you wrote with edgar mitchell and what i found kind of uh surprising is that edgar mitchell was into um our mutual friend john alexander doesn't like me to use this word but i think it's <laughs> accurate which is fringe some of the fringe areas, because they are on the, yeah. the fringe areas of the belief. Some of the more uh, kind of uh, what might be seen as wild ideas or certainly less more harder to digest for the mainstream. Um, but Podesta it entertained meeting with Mitchell and he even attempted to 
uh, meet with Mitchell. And now you've interviewed him, so you know uh, what he's into Mitchell was. He was very, from the time he came back to Earth after his Apollo mission, <clears throat> it was a very spiritual and uplifting uh, experience for him. And and he went on to 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 establish the uh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and he started he started studying with a lot of interesting people the idea that human consciousness is is far more complex and interesting and different than we've ever been taught to believe, and 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 he he came under a lot of criticism for for trying to get this kind of information out to the public. Um, and, and he believed all of these things until he died. And, and he was, he was very, very interested in, in talking to Podesta because he believed through his contacts with other people that extraterrestrials are here. They've been here for a long time. They're not just here to visit us. It's not like a, like they're out on a cruise and, oh, let's go check out the third planet from the sun. Uh, that he, he believed that, uh, that there were some violent and some nonviolent ETs that were here uh, and that they wanted to help mankind. But we've heard stories like that a lot mm-hmm. over the years from people with far fewer credentials than a guy like Edgar Mitchell. Mm -hmm. That's why I kept kept coming back to doing stories about him because he wasn't off his rocker. He was, he was really very highly regarded as a scientist and, and, and as a, as a a military pilot and he walked on the moon. And when he, he just, you know, this was the guy he had, he was one of those. He wasn't, he wasn't one of the original astronauts who had the right stuff, but damn he had the right stuff <laughs> on so on so many other levels that that a lot of the earlier astronauts never even dreamed of talking about. Mm-hmm. He was he was trying to help humans unlock the mysteries of the human mind. What could be wrong with that? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and I, so you can't blame Podesta for wanting to meet him just by because of who he is and yeah. wanting to meet with him. Um, I don't know if you saw it. This email, I'm sure you probably did. It came out uh, later, I think, after your story, where uh, Edgar Mitchell had, uh, and of course, none of these emails actually were written by Mitchell, but they were written by right. colleagues. Um, right. Some of them written by Rebecca Hardcastle, who you mm-hmm. talked about, and she's in there, but uh, she has written a blog about this. But um, where they said we would also like to meet with the president, and there was a right. response, and the response said. Uh, well, why don't we meet with Podesta first before we take yeah. this to the president? I read it more along, well, hold on there. We'll talk to Podesta first and, and then go from there. But, of course, yeah. some of the people have read it that Podesta was get, definitely going to take this to the president uh, because the president is in charge of all the UFO stuff. I don't know that i go that far. We don't know that he meant that at all. But um, I uh, Look, I, I've, I have felt... For years, that because of Podesta's position first in the White House when he was Bill Clinton's chief of staff, and and then for a year he was Barack Obama's special consultant or advisor, um, and then and then when that ended, uh, and he, he immediately became Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, he had the ear of all of these people. You know, if he wanted to knock on the room on the door of the Oval Office and go in and talk to Clinton or go in and talk to Obama and say, look, let, let's have a chat about UFOs. They would not have thrown him out of the office, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'll, I'll, I'll bet that, that they had some really interesting, provocative conversations, um, be, because otherwise, why, why would Podesta continue to, to, to take this stand? of, of the, trying to get the information out from the government. The government, you know, uh, doesn't have the right and, and, uh, and the American people can handle the truth and blah, blah, blah. I'm, I have to know that, or I have to feel that he said these things to these presidents mm-hmm. because he, he was a trusted member of the White House staff in a high position. Of course he must have had conversations with them. It sounds like you are dying 
to interview Potesta and ask him these questions? I, I, you know, I have, I have sent him a few emails. Um, haven't heard back from him. He, he's a very busy man. And you know what? <laughs> I, I like to say to myself to make me feel better. Hey, I'm a busy guy too. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason he I, <laughs> yeah, he should want to talk to you. But the reason <laughs> I say that is because, of course, I'm dying to interview him. But I'm sure yeah. we're both very jealous that someone did get to interview him. And we know this through the WikiLeaks, or we actually knew this before the WikiLeaks, but we yeah. know more about it. But Tom DeLonge, Mr. Blink-182 rock star, got to interview him. This interview's recorded. Hopefully it'll come out. But I, you know, I'm, this will be his first interview, really, where, I mean, KLAS, actually it was a, an affiliate of theirs, uh, interviewed asked Podesta a couple of UFO questions, but it was very short. Um, he's yeah. written some about it with, with Leslie Kane. Um, but a full on interview with him about UFOs, we really haven't seen. And I'm dying to see this documentary that Tom DeLong put together. You know, I I'm, I'm really anxious to see the documentary too. And, and above and beyond Podesta's involvement with it because of all the people, military people that, that are, going to be in the documentary but i'll tell you i i would be really surprised if if any conversation that tom DeLong had with podesta included podesta opening up with amazing information of what he knows about the truth about ufos i doubt that has happened i think you're I, right he's very tight-lipped uh, yeah. Even with the Las Vegas, was it a paper or a radio station? I think it was a, uh, a business section of of a Las Vegas paper or something like that uh, that asked the questions. But although this guy's a friend of George Knapp, do you remember this about well, six I remember nine the, months ago the, or something? The, I remember the KLAS interview where yeah. it was it wasn't George doing the interview, but it was it was the KLAS political reporter mm. or the political head. Mm -hmm. And they were just he was just sitting opposite opposite Podesta and there was nothing that Podesta said right. that he had said generically in any other UFO related interview before. He's right. been very careful about what he says mm -hmm. from from the days when he stood at the podium at the at the National Press Club in Washington and said it's time for the government to release the information. He hasn't he hasn't given any other information about what UFOs are all about. So he either he either doesn't know or he's unwilling to talk about it or or I don't know what other options are, but he hasn't said to anybody here's what i think is going on here's what i know is going on with ufos and and alien visits to planet earth i'm mm -hmm. going to tell you right now you can believe me because it's coming for me there's been nothing like that from anybody mm -hmm. and you know but and that's what i love about these tom DeLong WikiLeaks is that we now have an, at least an insight into what lengths he would go to uh, and him having access to everyone and anyone. Um, if I were to sit down and say, OK, and, and they told me you can interview anybody you want about UFOs. Who would you like to talk to if you could have a meeting about UFOs? I would want to talk to a guy in charge of Area 51. I would want to talk to a guy. Uh, who is in charge or, or was one of the leaders at Wright-Patterson, which is where uh, supposedly the Roswell craft and the aliens went, supposedly. Yeah. Uh, and right. we do know this. They investigated UFOs. And I would want to talk to someone uh, who is a leader at Air Force Space Command. And Tom DeLong mm -hmm. and Podesta had a meeting with three of those types of people. How amazing is that? Well, it, it's only amazing if they gave him useful, amazing information about what we're talking about here. That's because, true. You know, if they if they didn't say to him, OK, we're going to give you some answers and you may have to darken our faces because we don't want people to know who we are. Um, but we will tell you 
partially what's going on. You know, the truth is out there and that there's there are things about UFOs and the centuries and centuries of encounters between maybe extraterrestrials and humans. There, there are things about this subject that the public probably really wouldn't be able to handle and that there that the Vatican is aware of this information and it's being very tight lipped even though it says the Vatican has said in recent years that that they they think it would be a great thing to learn that we have interplanetary brothers and sisters because it wouldn't diminish religion it would expand god's dominion so <laughs> you know? you're saying but, the that, only way you would want to have a meeting with these guys is if they said that I, I would I would say I would like to have a meeting with someone who will let me know ahead of time that they will reveal some of the truth about it. And I would hope that that person could either be a sitting president or the pope. Okay? Here's why I disagree. I don't care what they would have. What <laughs> I would I don't care what they would tell me ahead of time okay I, I because and here's why because for instance i've learned so much from talking to any military person or norad person yeah. or nasa yeah. person i've talked to even the astronauts who are skeptic so for instance yeah. um he's got an astronaut i forget his name right now he was at a mufon symposium but Tom DeLonge's got uh, an image of him, or at least some, him talking in uh, the trailer for his documentary. Although we know this guy is a skeptic because we got to interview him at the is Mufon. Is that Sto uh, Sto Story Musgrave? There you go, Story Musgrave. He disagrees with, with Edgar Mitchell and yeah. uh, other uh, astronauts who believe they've seen UFOs. But still, how interviewing John... Um, Alexander or Charles Halt or Nick Pope, people who, mm -hmm. who are insiders, there's so much to learn from the inner workings, I feel, of all of this. And we do know, you know, that the Air Force investigated. Uh, yeah. So what happened with that? What do you guys do with that? Um, I, w I think I would have a ton of questions. I'd still really love to talk to them about all of this stuff. And according to Tom, I don't know if you've seen this because it's been taken down everywhere it's posted. But have you seen the trailer for his documentary? Yes, and I thought I thought it was really interesting. It was, and he yeah. does say that he's learned, and I don't know who he allegedly learned this from, that it is a bigger secret than than the public can handle, essentially. Yeah. That's why he has a there's a guy in near the end of the trailer who's in dark is in darkness. And and he basically says uh, that it, the, the truth about what's going on here, you couldn't handle. It's like it's like uh, Jack Nicholson from <laughs> yeah. A Few Good Men. You can't handle the truth. Uh -huh. you know? and, and, and you know what? I actually don't disagree with that. I my my whole attitude about UFOs has sort of evolved since I first started getting into it in 1975. Mm -hmm. um, and and. I was like a true believer back then. It's wow, we're being visited and blah blah blah. They're coming from other planets, and 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 my whole attitude has has sort of changed because of the people that I've talked to and interviewed, like you. You, I'm sure your attitude has changed because you've mm -hmm. had the, the good fortune, like I have, of interviewing some amazing people, and and getting their thoughts and their perspectives on things. And and I'm I'm, I'm at the point now where I actually think that. There's so much more to this whole UFO thing. John Alexander, perfect example. He's always saying to people, and he's considered a UFO skeptic, and a lot of the UFO community doesn't like his attitude, but he'll, he'll come right out and say to you, we're not asking the right questions. There's so much more to this UFO thing. Jacques Vallée will say the same thing. This is so much more complex than just interplanetary spaceships coming from somewhere and i i believe that now i think that this is bigger than any of us really know i don't know what it is and i won't even speculate because i don't have the right to speculate because i don't know i agree with you i mean 
I had Alexander, speaking of him, and that's why he's on the top of my mind, he was the last person I interviewed. And I interviewed him about Skinwalker, the Skinwalker yeah. Ranch. And that's a perfect example of how this whole thing is much more complex than just um, E.T. coming down here and, and flying around and checking us out or something like that. Right. It, it It's really... And if, of course... Uh, and that's what gets a little bit frustrating with SETI is that they take such a simplistic view of their mm-hmm. investigation. Um, if, if this is intelligences beyond our own, um, it would be difficult for us to fathom um, their modalities or their motives. Yeah. Just yeah. like, you know, uh, whatever pet you may have sitting next to you, the reasons why you do what you do is a complete mystery to your pet. They just, yeah. uh, the only actions they're most interested in is when you want to give them a scratch or, or you're going to feed them. But <laughs> otherwise, whatever the hell you're doing around the house, they don't know what the hell you're up to. I, I, I know. And that that makes me think of that, that now famous chapter 33 from Introductory Space Science, uh, the Air Force Academy uh, mm-hmm. science book from the 1960s, uh, in, in which, and it was written by... Uh, military personnel, and and it was for the only for the eyes of Air Force cadets uh, in Colorado Springs. And this chapter, a uh, very extensive chapter, set out to explain to the cadets the current thinking at that point in in the late sixties of what UFOs were. And they went through every possibility. It's, a, you know, misidentifications, astronomical things, hallucinations, blah, blah, blah. And they finally get down after they eliminated all the others, then they finally come down with alien visitors. And they clearly tell the cadets we're left with the unpleasant possibility of alien visitors to our planet, probably three or four groups of visitors at different stages of development. Mm-hmm. This is what the Air Force was telling their cadets. And at one point, uh, they raised their own question. Why no contact? And they answer their own contact. They say that when you go to the when you go to a zoo, you don't go there to contact the lizards, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and that any group of extraterrestrials, no matter how much more advanced they might be either technologically or intellectually, uh, they might look upon us as we look, would look upon insects. Mm-hmm. And, and so, again, and the only reason I even know about this chapter is because it was given to me in 1978 by the late Dr. J. Allen Hynek to use at the United Nations presentation that we put together. Mm-hmm. So here is one interesting question for these two people that were in this meeting with Tom yeah. DeLong and, and and Podesta is, I mean, they're both, you know, the guy that worked at Rat, Pat, Wright Patterson, he was in charge of the research labs, and the guy who um, was uh, the special assistant to the commander of Air Force Space Command, mm-hmm. did you, when you were in your physics class at the Air Force um, <laughs> Academy, do you yeah. remember that chapter, and yeah. what do you remember of it? You know, and you know, why was yeah. that chapter in there? I mean, those would be interesting questions to ask these guys, I think. Yeah, because because it was a real chapter. And, mm-hmm. and you know, another thing about that chapter, this this thing was was in the uh, the, the, the uh, this physics book in like 1967, 68. And within the context of this chapter, the Air Force officers who wrote the chapter actually refer to research at the time of Jacques and Janine Vallée, mm-hmm. his first wife. And at the end of the chapter, they have references to go to for if the, if the cadets wanted to further their readers, readers um, their, their information about UFOs. And you, you start reading down through the references. There are at least two or three references to Jacques Vallée books that were available at the time in 1967. It's like, mm-hmm. what what's going on here, folks? Why would they <laughs> use Jacques Vallée's books as a reference to their cadets if, in fact, there's nothing to this UFO thing at all? 
Well, and it could be, though. I mean, it's still possible. And, you know, I always stick to this because we have to prove otherwise. It's still possible that that whoever put that chapter together, the couple of people who did, I think it was two people right. listed, two officers, yeah. they were just yeah. good researchers. I mean, they were people who went to the references we would have rent, went to to write a similar chapter if we were tasked yeah. to do so. But it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean they have any more information or much more than the general public. Right. right. And, but but what, I, what I admire about that, and, and it's, it's kind of what I admire about what you do, and I'll pat myself on the back about this too, is, is, is people who bother to do research yeah. about something you know this is there are too many people out there that just throw their opinions around and speculate mm -hmm. um it, it it's like our friend stanton friedman the nuclear physicist he always says that the the debunkers have the, this mantra the mantra is um don't bother me with the facts my mind is already made up mm -hmm. i love that <laughs> yeah yeah it's great and i mean people will call uh, you might get this. I certainly get this. We know our friends get this. Uh, be called a skeptic. But it's important yeah. that um, um, I want, I, I don't know if I w would say I want to believe more. I think there's more mystery out there. But uh, unless I can prove it, you know, you, you can't go there or at least uh, uh, to be disciplined and to really try to build on the mystery. You can't go there. So you have to stick with what you know. Yeah. Um, and you know that, too, because in journalism, that's how you write. You have to justify the statements you make in your stories. We're, we're, we're living at a time. Sometimes I wish that I, would, I really was born 300 years in the future <laughs> at a time when we, we are part of a federation of planets. Yeah, that <laughs> would know, be great. We're, we're traveling at warp speed. Mm -hmm. But but we're at, we're at a point now where scientists, astronomers, are actually starting to loosen up a little bit because mm -hmm. of all of the galaxies that we now know are yeah. out there. Our human minds, we can't fathom. We can't understand what this must be like. Uh, that t Tens of millions of galaxies, each galaxy having billions of stars. And, and, and there are astronomers out there that are saying now that they believe that, that most of these stars have at least one planet orbiting mm -hmm. them. The, the numbers are staggering of what's out there. Um, when I when people say, well, there's no life out there, I just pull out a few pictures from the Hubble telescope and, and I'll say, you see this picture? Um, you, you see all of those little dots in this picture? Yeah, those are stars. No, this, 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 is, the, this is the Hubble deep field um, image that only shows galaxies. Mm -hmm. You every little dot that you see means it's just further away. These are galaxies with billions of stars, with billions of planets. This, to me, is evidence of life, because yeah. it can't be anything else. Mm -hmm. Now, my last question, even though it'll probably spawn more conversation, <laughs> but the last question is: um, yes. Do you feel? You've been able to learn uh, more than you knew, uh, given these WikiLeaks emails. I, I don't think that I've learned more than I knew, except in like little ways. Like I did not know that last November Hillary was on the Jimmy Kimmel show and she had been practicing mm -hmm. to talk about UFOs. I didn't know that. And yeah. that's why when I read the email, I, I jumped on it because I realized, oh, this is an interesting piece of information. I better write about this because I think that's news. So in that sense, by definition of what you just asked me, yeah, I've, I'm always learning new things. But th there's a part of me that that wonders, do I really want to know the truth? <laughs> Be because I keep saying to people, it's it's so much more complex. Mm -hmm. We don't know what their agenda is, where they really come from, why are they here. Uh, part of me is a little afraid to know the truth. Mm -hmm. And another part of me wants to know the truth. Um, so I, I have these, these inner arguments with myself about just how far am I willing to take this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Besides you know, the, the wanting to know part, uh, yeah. what is interesting about your answer there is that I was I was wanting to ask you this question, and a similar question came up when I was listening because I'm a news hound. I'm listening to NPR. I'm listening to the news yeah. all the time. A similar question came up in a in a uh, just a couple hours ago, or in a, when I was listening to the radio. They were like, "Do we did have we really learned anything from the WikiLeaks?" And their answer, I think, was similar to what you said, and applies in that not really. It it's that we knew the story. We didn't know all these fine, minute details and everything, yeah. but we knew the story. And this is kind of just telling us what we already knew, but giving us almost these uncomfortable voyeuristic type of of. Uh, insight into this and the same is true uh we know a little more for instance jimmy kimmel you know uh hillary being prepared uh i have a lot more respect personally actually because i was a little skeptical of tom DeLong and what who his sources really were so i'm yeah. really floored and and i i think it's really cool that he's done such great work to find some great sources so he's doing some good work to talk to the right people but other than that yeah we already knew Podesta was really into all this stuff. Now we just have a little more kind of um, dressing to the story, but we—it's not like we know a whole lot more. That's that's mind-boggling, or or anything. Um, even though some people are out there speculating that some of this information may mean a lot more than I think we can read into it. Um, yeah. Well, even even Podesta has said. Um, that he hasn't taken the time to go looking through all these WikiLeaks emails, so he 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 can't verify if these are even accurate, mm -hmm. you know, or if somebody in in the right. in the process of hacking them, they might have changed something or created new ones. Right. And so, yeah, sure, that's always a, a possibility. Uh, I mean, so, some people might say, well, that's just a cop out. You know, he he knows that they're authentic, and he's just not willing to 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 cop to it. Well, I don't know the answer to that. You know, I I I don't know how any other human being makes their own decisions about their actions. I only know about myself. I know how I decide to do or say something, and then I move forward with it. I can't speak for anybody else. And, and damn it, nobody can speak for anybody else. That's why all these skeptics and debunkers out there are claiming, well, this person said that, but they couldn't possibly mean that. Yeah. No, we don't know that. You mm -hmm. can't make pronouncements or proclamations like that because you don't know mm -hmm. it's like i wanted to say to people just take care of your own business <laughs> know what you're going to say and stick by it and let and let the chips fall where they may with other people because in the end some truth is going to come out and i'm just sorry that i, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime mm -hmm. but i'll just have to wait to come back in another body and maybe i'll be part of the uh, starfleet federation <laughs> yeah <laughs> next time that would be pretty cool. But you might be some kind of funny-looking creature. Well, I already am that. <laughs> From another planet or something. <laughs> so, great. Anything else you want to say about the WikiLeaks, the UFOs, or, or Podesta? I, 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 just, I just would like people to, to not jump on things really fast. I mean, he's a perfect example. Perfect. In the last couple of weeks, I've received a couple of emails from a guy, I'm not going to mention his name, but he, he's kind of become um, a correspondent of mine, one of my readers. And he's always asking me about, you know, Lee, what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And why, why, why didn't this happen? Well, lately, he has sent me some emails basically saying, Lee, what, what's going on with Tom DeLong? Why has he suddenly gone silent? And that'll be the end of this email. And then like a couple of days later, when I haven't responded to him, he'll say, Lee, it's been it's been like 10 days since we've heard anything from Tom DeLong. What's going on with that? And, and I finally responded to him and I said, look, I don't know what Tom DeLong is thinking, what he's doing, who he's talking to. It's not my business. It's his business, what he does, the, the decisions that he makes in his life. And and that that's good enough for me. I don't have to go crazy wondering why haven't we heard from Tom DeLong in mm -hmm. seven days. And so I suggest to you 
that that you don't make yourself crazy. You know, live your life. You know, be open to possibilities uh, and the wonder of of new knowledge. But don't make yourself so crazy that it it can give you ulcers. Because I think people are getting ulcers out of the anxiety of what's going on with UFOs. I mean, you and I, we haven't even touched upon, and we'll do this at some other point, on this whole other culture that's now called experiencers. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is like a huge thing, like it never was 10 years ago, of people who believe, strongly believe, they've had some kind of real contact with some entities from somewhere else. And and it's a lot of people. It has grown into the subculture of UFOs in this country, and it's it's international now too. It, it's amazing to watch it. And and I'm not saying that I doubt people, but I'm just saying, please, everybody, keep an open mind with with the things that you say, with the things that you think, and read as much as you can. Listen to credible people. Uh, on radio shows or in TV documentaries, just just gather as much information as you can, so that when you decide you want to talk about UFOs at a party or somewhere, that you do it with an informed opinion, so that you do it saying to people, "Well, I believe that this is true because here's what I read, or here's I interviewed this person who told me this," and and come at this, everybody with with an informed opinion instead of just throwing this crap out there that 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 indicates right away that you don't know what you're talking about have intelligent conversations with other people about this you know no matter what you believe and i say this to everybody everybody has an opinion about ufos whether they think it's crap or whether they think that invasion is imminent Everybody has an opinion, and I think that's good. I think we uh -huh. should we should build on that and yeah. talk about it with everybody. Um, really, even your everyone has a, yeah, even your favorite researchers have different opinions. Not every nobody has the same exact opinion, and yeah. there's nothing yeah. wrong with having different opinions. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong, or you're right and I'm wrong. There there is no right or wrong. Um, there's just knowledge. If we can just find the right pathway to to the knowledge, no matter no matter how it will make us all feel as as inhabitants on planet Earth, you know, uh, I'm hoping that that the truth of UFOs won't be too much for us to handle. Mm -hmm. But I'm not convinced of that yet. So I I kind of walk as carefully as I can because I don't want to stumble onto someone's spaceship and be probed mm. <laughs> you know against my consent <laughs> yeah that would not be fun and that would be uh i don't need that sort of disclosure <laughs> <laughs> right. dip this this probler or something this this probler <laughs> yeah but um, it's funny because while you were saying that it was making me think of there's no good guy there's no bad guy there's just right. you and me and we just disagree and we just disagree, and 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 that's okay. Let's all the young people can't... won't know that that comes from a song. Why can't we be friends? <laughs> yeah, another song. <laughs> all, all we right. are saying is give is give peace a chance. Yeah, <laughs> give peace a chance, aliens. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much. This has been oh, really yeah, interesting. You. They were great stories. Uh, it's. I think it's so great that they got front page news and they were in the political section, um, which of course then uh, causes other media outlets to take a look at this stuff. And uh, mm. I, I really love the Kimmel thing too. I think it was so neat that uh, Hillary was practicing UAP and she still screwed it up. <laughs> you know, and I think if, if, if I ever have the chance to interview her, yeah. One of the first things I'm going to ask her is, Madam Madam President, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, when you were practicing for that five minutes before that Kimmel show, what exactly were you practicing? What were you going over in your mind? Please yeah. tell me. <laughs> your notes might have been a little off. 
<laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And of course, people could go to the Huffington Post to see more. And uh, you can go to the search section and put Lee Spiegel and your uh, stories will come up. Well, and, and right back at you, I think if they go to the search section and write in Alejandro Rojas, they should find some cool stuff there, too. They will get a couple of stories there, too, but not as many as yours. So and <laughs> nothing, no front page news either. So, well, uh, you're, you're, a front, you're a front page guy in my heart. Oh, well, thanks, buddy. Well, it was great talking to you. Thank you so much for being on the show again. And um, we'll be talking soon. I mean, it's it's coming upon time to do our end of year review. That's only a couple I months know. away. I know. And and the, the, the top stories of the year are already piling up. <laughs> exactly. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you so much to Mr. Spiegel for uh, joining us today to talk about the wiki, 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 wiki leaks. It's hard for me to say wiki leaks without doing the wiki, wiki, wiki. Um, so um, I apologize for that. However, uh, you know, I think this is all making for a really interesting story, and who knows, there may be more to come, but uh, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Remember, you can always find Lee at Huffington Post. You just go to the Huffington Post, and in the search, put Lee Spiegel. You'll be able to find his stories. You could search UFO, or you could even just do Huffington Lee Spiegel on Google. You could probably just do Lee Spiegel on Google and find his stuff, too. He actually has a website, uh, LeeSpiegel.com, with a little more information, including information about his incredible, his own incredible triangle UFO sighting. Cool stuff. Of course, we've interviewed him about that and many, many other things. So thank you so much to Lee for joining us on the show. And congratulations for your stories getting to the front page of Huffington Post. I mean, I know that's coveted. People uh, are, are scrambling to to get on the front page, and, and his UFO stories made it, so really cool. Not the first time his UFO stories have made it to the front page, but uh, two in a row, that's probably the first time, so it's really cool. Um, otherwise, I want to thank, of course, Martin Willis for joining us in the morning with the news. Of course, join him on Podcast UFO, another podcast out there, another great one. And then also, thank you to Caleb Hanks for the opening and close music. Remember, you can go to openminds.tv to find all of the news that uh, Lee and Martin and I spoke about. You can also find information on watching videos. So we have a video portal where you can see all of the UFO lectures from scientists, from some of the top people in the field, uh, from some very, very important people on our video portal at openminds.tv. And most of those videos come from the UFO Congress. So the International UFO Congress, which is coming up here again in February. We have almost all of the speakers listed. We only have two more to list, and we're just getting our paperwork and ducks in a row. We do know who these people are, but I'm not going to tell you. Nanny, nanny. You're going to have to wait but, of course, you guys are my coveted podcast listeners. Very VIPs to me. You're a VIP to me. I just thought that'd be cute because it rhymes. And so I usually give you the uh, inside scoop. And I will, but not today. So uh, soon I'll give you some more information. You'll be the first to hear it here on the Open Mind UFO podcast about who's coming up. But you're going to love it. So two more people to be listed soon. Otherwise, we have an incredible listing of cool speakers. Go to ufocongress.com to check that out. That's right, ufocongress.com. And uh, you'll be able to see who we've got thus far. You'll be able to register. Right now, you can get early bird tickets so you can get a discount. So go get your...